Hi folks, welcome to the Epochs of the Lotus Eaters number 59, William the Marshal, the greatest knight in Christendom. As promised, I am here with Bo, and we are very excited to cover this topic, I think. Uh, it's safe to say. So where do we begin in Plantagenet, England? Yes, so there's a lot to say. This this person's life, William Marshall, William the Marshal. Um, but he just it, comes to be known as the Marshal, doesn't he? Yeah, yeah. Because he's just or, the best. Or sometimes the Earl Marshal. Because just to say real quick, right at the beginning, he's not a noble. No. Yeah. Well, he's the second son of a very, very, very minor noble family. They're mm. barely noble, really. He's the second son, so wouldn't inherit even anyway. And, but he ends up the first Earl of Pembroke. But we'll get into that. <laughs> right, I think okay, that's yeah, super yeah. So he's yeah. born extremely, well, not extremely lowly, but he's born very, very lowly. Sort of yeah. as lowly as you can get without being an actual peasant. Mm. And by the end of his career, he's the first Earl of Pembroke and Regent of England. <laughs> he's the most powerful man in England, easily. Um, and everyone, it seems nearly everyone, uh, respects and loves him. <laughs> so he is uh, quite an incredible figure. Love it. Um, yeah, and, and so sometimes he's, he's got a few different names, uh, like sort of uh, the Earl Marshal sometimes he's called, sometimes the Earl of Pembroke, sometimes William Marshall, sometimes just the Marshal. Mm. Sometimes William the Marshal. So anyway, all sorts of names for this guy. And But what he seems to be is absolutely loyal. That's the thing that just comes back again and again and again and again, even, it puts, even if it puts him in hot water, in an impossible position politically or physically, he will remain loyal to what he's pledged. Right, okay. So he's um, a man of his word. Yeah. And yeah. The, the, okay, so to the, a fault. The, the, I think there's something important to note here that um, in in this day and age, uh, oaths were the way that society was formed, as in it kept everything, the entire structure of society together. And a man was uh, being an oath breaker is is a is a is a, a curse. Yeah. It's a cruel and evil thing, and it was like it's it's in the modern era. It's hard to overstate how important an oath was. Like it was a sacred oath before God and the church and society itself, and you were expected to keep it until your death. And being an oathbreaker was just, I mean, literally the word warlock means oathbreaker. Mm. It, is, it is an evil word with an evil sound, and it was used for evil people. And we, we don't really have an equivalent of this in the modern era, really. Mm. And it's, it's hard to explain to someone who do, doesn't come from this kind of deeply relational world where everyone has a station in life and everything is connected through relationships to everyone else, just how important these relationships were and what it means to be loyal unto this sort of point of, you know, self harm. <laughs> you know, it, it's, it's hard to explain to someone outside of that, but that was the medieval world. And that's why someone breaking an oath was literally the worst thing you could do. It was, it was, you know, social stigma forever for breaking your oath. Yeah, no, absolutely. In a slightly earlier period than this, uh, in the age of uh, William, uh, William the Second and Henry the First, if you broke an oath, you were declared nithing, which is an Anglo-Saxon word, which just means worthless. Yeah, y your life is of no worth if you yeah. broke your oath, which is all very well and good. Oh, just to put this in context, uh, the Marshal's dates are eleven forty-six to twelve nineteen. Mm. So it's quite, it's very early on. Mm. It's very, very early um, uh, medieval period. Um, so his life spans the reigns of Henry II, uh, Richard the Lionheart, John, and then the the, the boy Henry III. Uh, but yeah, just about oaths, just super quick to yeah. say, is that you're absolutely right. Everything you said there is absolutely right. And it's hard for us to, uh, in a modern world, where you're not really expected to keep your word ever. If you sign a legal contract, that's one thing. Hmm. But what you say to people, you know, yeah, verbal yeah, contract's not worth anything, you know. Yeah, yeah. Whereas the, their world was very different. However, having said all of that, um, someone that kept their oath to a fault at all times, no matter what, like William the Marshal, was a bit unusual because there's just real politic, isn't there? Yeah. Um, there's one thing to that oaths are a lot more valuable than they are to us today. But if and when you had to break them or you thought you had to for political reasons, for money reasons, mm -hmm. then people would still. Yeah. So one example of that, just real quick, right at the end of the story, right towards the end of the story, uh, William Marshall uh, negotiates a treaty with one of the princes of France, a Louis, um, and uh, and and Louis breaks it, mm. goes home, escapes with his life, but then breaks it. And people, sort of historians, look back at William Marshall and said, you're a bit credulous there, a tiny bit credulous. You expected him to be as noble as you, 
and he's not many are hardly anyone was really conversely we have good examples of it say when the black prince captures is it king john of france yeah, there's still lots. Yeah, there's and, loads of uh, you know, and he says, right, you can go back to France and raise the money, and he can't raise the money, so he hands himself back to the English. Yeah, like again, yeah. like you, you, you can't have something like that happen without oaths having this kind of incredible impulsion behind them. You know, yeah. and like the the honor of the person would be so it would be it would be worse to damage that person's personal honor than mm. it would be to spend time in English captivity. Mm. You know, and so it's it's just. Like you say, there are of course people who break them, you know, obviously, but uh, but there are also people who don't, and that is remarkable to me. And it's most. Oh, yeah. you're right. I mean, yeah. I'm finding examples of there to say that it's not sort of a hard and fast thing. But yeah, most. So yeah. there was one. I think I can't remember if it was after Tour or Cressy, but at one point, um, a, a whole uh, cadre of French knights were captured, mm. and they were told, "Look, we'll release you back to your estates to go and raise your own ransoms, yeah. um, and then you return to us a year later or whatever." Um, and uh, if you've got the money, then all well and good. And if not, we'll have to imprison you at that point. And they all returned, some that could pay and some couldn't, but they all returned because, yeah, yeah they, they took oaths seriously. That's mad, isn't um, it? Like, I suppose in, if you genuinely believed, which most people seem to have done, um, that your word and your honour were wrapped up with mm. the the fate of your immortal soul. Yeah. That if you lied, yeah. particularly big liars, um you you're, you would suffer in the sulfurs of hell for eternity. Well, that's the thing. <laughs> and that's you, a very real prospect. Absolutely. So, I mean, these are deeply, uh, deeply Christian people, and they believe they're swearing before God mm, when they make an oath. Mm. And so it, it actually did hold the fabric of medieval Europe together. It's not just in one country. You know, you could expect the same in Germany, in Spain, in Italy, in England, in Scotland. You know, it's, it's actually quite mad how well-bonded Europe was through this sort of Christian belief. And it, in a way, I do actually find it very, very noble. Like, I, you know, it's, it's genuinely an ideal that I admire. So Yeah, and it's not just Christianity. So, for no. example, no. there's a bit in on the Third Crusade when the Coeur de Lyon is out in, in the, the Holy Land. Yeah. At some point, it, it, it becomes clear that they're not going to be able to invest or sack Jerusalem. Mm. Uh, but a lot of his senior men really, really want to visit the the uh, the Holy Sepulchre mm. in Jerusalem. So Saladin says, "All right, I'll let you. Yeah. I'll, I'll, I promise you that we won't just murder you yeah. as soon as you're inside the." And so yeah, like a few dozen of the of Richard's most powerful magnates are led into Jerusalem. They get to pray at the Holy Sepulchre and leave again. And Saladin keeps his word. Mm. Um, so I think it's just a world with a lot more. Uh, I don't know trustfulness because of course there's loads of examples where people break their word and all sorts of things but quite a lot of the time um you could actually expect them to honor it yeah um quick line here from oh there was a there is a a history of um of the marshal from just after commissioned by his eldest son just after he died so in the 1220s and um it How survived to us this that? day yeah that's such a great thing to have happen it's one of the earliest it is one of if not the earliest biography of a knight mm. Um, and you can buy it now in, uh, you can, you can buy a copy of it now. <laughs> um, <laughs> we, we happen to have it's, it. It's extant. It's an incredible read. I think really incredible read. Yeah. Um, there's just one, I've got a few lines here, but there's one line here just to sum him up. It said, uh, he performed so many feats of arms that every great Lord, every count and baron and knight yearned to match him. And what a, and what a hard time he gave his jealous rivals, but he wasn't concerned with spoils. He was so intent on fighting well that he gave no thought to booty. Um, he won something of far more value, uh, for the man who wins honor has made a rich profit indeed. And so there's just loads and loads of examples throughout his life. There's a whole period in his life where he becomes uh, just the best around on the tournament circuit. Mm. And we'll get into that and I'll explain that a bit more. But um, during that window of time, it's just said again and again and again that he wasn't interested in money or spoils or humiliating his enemies or lording it over people or anything. It was just the pure honour of being able to win in a fight or mm. not. Um, um which again, you know, not really singing your own praises massively as well. So it's just all the character traits that were valued at that time, and mostly now. As well. I was going to say, how are they not valued uh, now? Right. You yeah. Know, how could you not respect such a man? <laughs> yeah. Know? Yeah. Um, okay. I mean, there's just uh, there, you yeah, can just yeah. find lots and lots of examples of of people saying how great he was. Or well, one example is when he does die, 
um, because he's um, nominally the enemy of the kings of France, uh, but at different points does um, owe his sort of their liegemen because he has lands in Mm. Normandy. So his relationship with the French monarchy, the Capetians, is odd and strange Mm. and uh, back and forth and a bit of a contradiction. But but basically, he was sort of their enemy for most of his life. Mm. And when they get the news that he's died, they're all upset. They're like, yeah, no, he was the greatest. He was our enemy most of the time, but... (laughs) <laughs> but uh, he was the greatest knight that had ever lived. And... But again, it's the sort of the sort of uh, similar vein where Richard has to admit the nobility of Saladin. You know, it's like, okay, look, we're enemies, but you're not a bad man. Mm-hmm. You know, I don't hate you. You know, it's right. just that yeah. you know circumstances forced us into conflict. And in fact, we're going to have to do the Third Crusade at some point because it's, it's bloody amazing. Yeah, um, yeah uh, but uh, well, but... I'll just do the life of Richard. Oh yeah, of yeah. which that's. The most interesting bit, isn't it? Yeah, I think. Yo, absolutely. Um, I, don't, I don't know. He's got, got fascinating. Anyway, let's maybe we could it. do Richard then Saladin the same thing from different sides. I don't know. Maybe anyway, yeah. we'll think about that. Yeah, <laughs> we'll anyway. have a think about that. Um, all right, so let's uh, just crack on with his life then, because mm. you could spend. I could probably spend half hour just talking about how people talked about him generally as the best knight, yeah. the best man, all sorts of things. Um, um, yeah, uh, so, but, but he so, seems to have earned it yeah, rightly, yeah. as far as I can tell. Yeah, no, yeah, definitely. Um, so his his father was a chap called John Marshall, like I say, very very minor nobility, and their surname Marshall probably came from an even earlier period where um, his family were were sort of uh, designated to be protectors on some level of the crown to be mm-hmm. you know to to be a marshal. Mm-hmm. Um, Because surnames were a bit different in those days. So anyway, during the anarchy, the civil war Surnames came from what you did. Right, yeah. So if your surname's Thatcher, you're quite literally a Thatcher. Or a Smith, you were a blacksmith. Yeah. All sorts of things. Archer, yeah, loads of things. It's very easy to figure out what English people did (laughs) in history (laughs) just through their surnames, which is very useful. It's surprising how many Smiths there are, aren't there? Yeah. Every sort of small hamlet probably needed their own Smith. Um, anyway, um, so William Marshall, he was the second son, though. Um, and though things aren't written in stone, primogeniture, that everything has to pass to the first son, families were still at liberty to split things up if they wanted to. But they didn't. Everything was always going to go to the eldest son, mm. William the Marshall's elder brother. So he sort of had to make his own way in life. That's what they say. And this it? was yeah. very common for the mm. young men of Europe for hundreds of years. And there, there's an entire like genre of books written for like the second sons mm. like what are you going to do you're going to go off and be an adventurer you need to be a, a, a you know a good christian noble adventurer because you're not going to get anything like and this was one of the reasons that the middle ages is rife with like you know young men adventuring and crusading and things like this because they they're dispossessed they're not going to inherit anything and they know that and so well you've got to mm. go win something mm. yeah no absolutely it's, yeah you've got you've got to um, live and die on your own merits yeah um, we said in another one, um, and this tradition goes up to the 19th century, the first son inherits, hmm. the second son is groomed for the clergy, yeah. and uh, the third son goes in the army, hmm. uh, maybe one or two others in the army, and the rest just whatever, do what you want, yeah. <laughs> so almost, yeah. Um, yeah. Who knows? get on with your life. Yeah. Uh, don't Go be a poet or something. You know? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. don't cause too much trouble for your eldest brother. Yeah. That's, uh, <laughs> yeah. You know, exactly. um, that's sort of what it's like. Yeah. So, um, yeah, well, okay, so... Um, his father, John Marshall, sides with in the civil war between Stephen of Blois, King Stephen I, and um, his antagonist Matilda, the Empress Matilda. Hmm. Um, to begin with, he sides with Stephen, but uh, very quickly goes over to Matil- Matilda's side. And it's from then on absolutely staunchly on Matilda's side, which is to say the Argevin side, because um, Matilda's husband was Geoffrey of Anjou, mm-hmm. Geoffrey Plantagenet. Yeah. Plantagenet's actually a bit of a nickname. It comes from... Some um, flower that he wore in his hat, some yellow flower he oh, wore really? in his hat. Um, and the French word for that is similar to Plantagenet. And mm. So that's what it is. But it's actually Geoffrey of Anjou. And so anyway, they have a son, a Henry. And then when the Geoffrey of Anjou dies sort of unexpectedly a bit young, the young Henry, Matilda's son, uh, becomes Henry II, um, beats Stephen at a battle. Um, Stephen's allowed to die on the throne, but Henry will, Henry II, will, Henry Plantagenet will be, be his heir. Mm. But then he dies a year later in suspicious circumstances. Mm. Henry II then marries Eleanor of Aquitaine, and the story really begins. Um, so Marshall at this point is, um, um, well, let's start with his childhood. So things that happened in his childhood that are 
uh, sort of important is that at one point he's given as a hostage um, in inverted commas. Yeah. So um, for anyone who doesn't know, there, there is a practice in the ancient world and the medieval world of uh, being, as you say, given a young, young young man being given as a hostage. Now, this isn't what we think of when we think of hostages. Uh, what this is is to spend. It's like a secondment as a as an academic or something like that. You know, you you are like you spend a period of time at another university uh, and work and operate there until you are returned to your your original university. And it's kind of like that, where the the young the young prince or knight or whoever it is uh, just goes and lives with um, not necessarily a rival but like another family for a period of time and they're free and they, you know, they, this is like um, Theon Greyjoy in Game of Thrones. That's mm. where they get this idea from. Mm. Uh, mm. And so they go live with this family for a number of years and then return to their original family after this period has elapsed. And, uh, you know, they're meant to be raised and trained in, you know, the good manly ways, be good Christians, you know, get a proper education. They're well treated. So hostage in mm. the modern sense really implies ill treatment, whereas in fact in the ancient and medieval world it was not. Just to be clear. Yeah, I mean, we think of hostage as sort of Terry Waite or Ken mm -hmm. Bigley or something. Uh, Terry Waite. <laughs> he, was a, he was a hostage that was handcuffed to a radiator in Beirut for oh, 10 right. years okay, or whatever right. Yeah, it was. yeah, yeah. It's um, not like that. Yeah, like Pyrrhus was a hostage of Ptolemy, wasn't yes, he? Yes, yeah. uh, There's loads and loads of yeah. examples. And um, But you... when Pyrrhus is a, Tol a, ho a hostage of Ptolemy, what he's doing is riding around in a chariot hunting lions and impressing the king with his martial abilities. You know, this is and, and being promised his daughter in marriage and things like this. Hostage is the wrong word in modern parlance for it, definitely. Getting to live the life of a prince. Yeah, exactly. If that's being yeah. hostage, then okay. Yeah, yeah I'd, <laughs> love, I'd love it. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, no, it's you're not yeah, but but yeah, anyway. Um you get the point. So um so yeah, he was held hostage by the Stevens party after the siege of Newbury. Um, and it's around this time where he's a bit, a bit, a little bit after that. Um, he's sent off to Normandy because most magnates, most pow powerful barons and lords, are really Anglo-Norman at this mm. point. Um, and in fact, most of the accounts and uh, the history is in Anglo-Norman French. Mm -hmm. So that sort of gives you an idea. Um, and he's um, he's raised to be a squire, sort of his adolescent years. Mm. He's <coughs> <coughs> Pardon me. Um, in his adolescent years, he was trained formally to be a squire. Hmm. Um, so as I say, uh, you know, really quite minor nobility, but he, he Do you totally... Want to grab a drink? He to uh, no, I'm we, fine. Are you, are you sure? Yeah, yeah, so we can yeah. cut this bit. Just... No, I'm good. Yeah. Um, but he, even though he's very, very minor nobility, he does know the norms, you hmm. know, the accepted yeah. things of how to behave in court, hmm. uh, courtliness. Quite literally, yeah. Because how I mean, this, to behave at court? Th this isn't even two hundred years after the Norman Conquest. Yeah, you know, we're so, talking like the eleven fifties. His yeah. adolescence is the eleven fifties, sixties. So very early on. Yeah. yeah. So the, the, these are people whose grandparents were fighting with William the Conqueror. Yeah. And you know whose yeah, parents yeah, are like you yeah, know the, yeah, the yeah. descendants of that. So they you know they've got within living memory. The, well, Matilda and Stephen are the grandchildren of the Conqueror. Yeah. So yeah, like four generations at absolute most. Yeah. At absolute most. So, yeah, I mean, this is before John has lost all of Normandy. Um, so, so, yeah, sort of the the uh, the Anglo-Norman Empire is still yeah. one. And it's and a, it's, a, it's height, really, isn't it? It's, yeah, well, Henry II, the Angevin Empire, stretches from sort of the borders of Scotland to the Pyrenees. Mm. It's a f much, much, much bigger than the French kingdom. Oh, yeah. Much, yeah. much bigger yeah. and richer. Um uh, but so, yeah, we'll get into that. In his adolescence, he was trained to be a squire. And apparently, um, uh, everyone could see, um, even as an adolescent, like he's good. He's going to be a great fighter, a great warrior. Mm. Sort of his martial prowess. Um, there's various ways, various ways of saying it. But um, it was, he must have been big and strong. Yeah. That's clear. He was and he must big have and had strong some skills. Oh, yeah. And yeah. really skillful. Yeah. And the thing is, he, um, there, there, there's there's a there's a quote from there's a Roman quote that I keep bringing up, where it's like you know, out of every hundred men, you've got ten sort of you know actual fighters. Then you've got one man who's really good, and he's the one who wins the battle. And that's clearly what William is. You know, he's that yeah. one guy who just likes fighting. Yeah, he's just good at it. He gets a visceral thrill out of the victory and out of the combat itself. And that's you know just an archetype. 
You know, there's some things that are extremely hard to repeatedly do well at and win. Mm. And the only people that do, uh, there's no way to argue they're not great at what they do. For example, yeah. uh, for, for one example, poker players. Mm. It's not luck yeah. that the same guys keep winning the biggest tournaments. It's not mm -hmm. luck. There's elements of luck, sure. But it's not like they're not yeah. getting lucky again and again and again and again. It's skill. It's ability. Yeah. Um, same with perhaps um, doing well in uh, racing, race car driving mm -hmm. or uh, fighting. Yeah. You know, Mayweather wasn't lucky to retire undefeated. No, no, not at all. Yeah, right. You know, this... and, and so it's the same with the marshal. Yeah. And, he, and it's he unbelievably. Must have had skill. Sorry. Um, yeah. But the, you, and the, the, the remarkable amount of danger that he must have been essentially persistently in. <laughs> yeah throughout his entire life, it, it, it gives you an indication this is the kind of man who enjoyed this. You know, you can't, you, you have to have a genuine passion for something to be an expert in it, I think. And, you know, that's, there, there is definitely an archetype of man who enjoys fighting and, you know, it's very respectable in the Middle Ages. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's, um, yeah, there's, there's no, there's no downside, great... sort of morally. No, 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 not it. at all. There's, there's no sort of finger wagging and frowning. No, there's that no prohibition you're, that you're sort of toxic. <laughs> yeah, for wanting to smash yeah. other guys over the head all the time. Yeah, there aren't any um, pacifists around at this point. <laughs> well, there probably are some. Actually, but... um, and I say smash guys over the head uh, rather than cutting them up, because yeah. quite often we'll get into this in a minute. Um, it's uh, it's very violent, but it's relatively bloodless mm. for the upper echelons. And we'll get into exactly how that played out. Like, you'd want to beat him down, but you don't want to kill him. And if you've injured him too badly, even that's a bit of a no-no. Mm. Um, but we'll, we'll, we'll get into that because it's uh, battles. Are, the, the, the crossover between battles and tournaments is really interesting. Uh, yes. Uh, tournaments yeah, yeah. are crazily violent and battles are a lot less violent than you might think. It's, yeah. but we'll, we'll get into that. So just to uh, sort of finish off on his childhood, um, when he's young, still in his sort of late adolescence, um, he enters, he's entered um, on behalf of his Norman liege lord into a couple of tournaments and wins them. Hmm. Um, it's not like, um, it's not necessarily like a, a, like a football tournament, like the World Cup, where you end up, uh, in like a knockout tournament, you end up with one winner. It's not necessarily like that, no. but it's just some nights will do better that day than others. Mm. And the few that have sort of quite clearly done the best are considered to be winners. But mm. uh, anyway, <laughs> we'll get into that. It so must have been he, terribly uh, impressive though, at a young age. Yeah. Um, and one thing here is that because it says the second son of a minor family, he's got no ability to even buy a horse or he's got no ability to even maintain the horse mm. let alone buy one let alone buy a suit of chain and plate mm. and a good sword and a great helm he couldn't afford any of that but where he's been a squire for his liege lord in normandy i can't remember uh who it was uh but the he is obliged to give him a horse for a tournament oh thank you very like much just that yeah so he gets like the bare minimum that he's sort of obliged by rights to yeah. to ask for he gets it and converts that into a tournament wins, yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. Because the, the other thing is... This that, is very much like, have you seen the, A Knight's Tale? Uh, I saw a bit of it. It's very much like that, where it's like, you yeah. know, not grifter, but like, you know, you know, but down on your luck, young man who's just got a lot of spirit. He's right. like, right, I'm just going to do this because I can. And uh, it's very much, that's, that's an awesome story. It's like, starts with yeah. virtually nothing. He's like, yeah, well, I can still win. Watch it. Is that... Is that, did that have Keith Ledger in it? Yeah, is Heath right? Ledger, I think it's. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Did yeah, I say yeah. Keith Ledger? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> But yeah, it is, yeah. <laughs> that Keith Ledger's yeah. uh, does yeah. a good performance in that. No, yeah, yeah Heath Ledger. Um, yeah, I thought I, I sort of watched half of it. I can't, mind, can't remember why I turned it off, but um, oh, would they have some ginger bloke playing Geoffrey Chaucer as well? I seem yeah. to remember. I seem to remember the two female roles in that looked really similar. It was almost like they looked. I couldn't distinguish between the two I can't remember I found. leads. But anyway. But anyway, yeah. so the very, very young William Marshall converts his his sort of um, one horse and mm. a bit of really, bit of really crappy armour into tournament wins. And actually, I think they mention it in that film, A Knight's Tale, is that if if it's a night-on-night -night action, if you defeat mm. him thoroughly, a full-blown defeat, you get all his stuff. You get his horse and his armour and everything. How lovely. Yeah. So William Marshall comes back with hordes so normally between two rich noblemen it's sort of a here or there yeah. you know it's like i've got 20 more horses i don't care it's like millionaires betting 20 pound with each other don't 
doesn't yeah. matter. No one cares. Yeah. It's like, yeah, interesting. Yeah, you won a hundred pound off me today. It's, mm. it's absolutely nothing. I, I will not notice. Mm. It's like it's not even the interest on my fortune that day. Not even yeah. close. Whereas to some people, I think like in a Knight's Tale, to get his stuff is a life changing thing, and to mm. lose all yours is dis absolute disastrous. So anyway, that's the position he's in to begin with. But he acquits himself well. Um, so not long after that, there's uh, there's there's um, a war. In France, Henry II uh, has a campaign in, in Poitou, mm -hmm. which is uh, down much near um, the Aquitaine. Uh, so in the middle, right in the middle of France, really. Mm. And um, and the Marshal's family are, um, or as I say, his father had sided with Matilda and Geoffrey of Anjou and then Henry of Anjou. So they're Argevins. Mm. So when Henry II is having a war in France, he fights for Henry. Right, okay. Um, as, and, you, as uh, you would expect. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, at one point, he he seems to have formed a quite a close relationship with Eleanor of Aquitaine. Not sexual, let's be clear. Again, there's... No question of that. Yeah, the, the idea of courtly romances is very strange. We're not going to go into it in long, ex extended detail here, but it would definitely not have been a sexual relationship. And one thing to mention about Eleanor of Aquitaine, she was a bit older. She'd been on crusade incredibly oh, yeah. earlier in her We're life. We're going to have to do one on her because oh. she's just got – she the most powerful it. woman in Europe by far. I've know. just finished a biography of hers actually. Oh, really? Yeah, okay. I've been very, very yeah, slowly definitely. reading it for about yeah. two years in the bathroom. <laughs> and I finished it the other week. Yeah. And the incredible life, absolutely incredible. Yeah. Uh, in fact, it almost rivals the Marshalls mm. in all sorts of ways. Uh, so anyway, she was a, a worldly lady and uh, she obviously saw in the Marshall sort of greatness, even at a young mm -hmm. age, and he was sort of part of her entourage briefly. And then they get um, basically ambushed by one of the other greatest knights of the age, Guy de Lusignan. I don't know Ooh, if you've ever heard yeah, of him. Uh, he's a crusading guy. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, arguably, you could say Guy de Lusignan is... Uh, perhaps at this age when the marshal is mm -hmm. still a very, very young man, he's probably the greatest knight in Christendom right, okay. at the time, or arguably. Because um, quite often um, it's always the thing, who's the best knight in the world? Um, and people nearly quite often say in the age of uh, Richard the Lionheart, after this, it's mm. Richard the Lionheart. Mm. But people always agree if you don't count the marshal. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, just a very quick aside, me and my friends when we were growing up would quite often talk about who's sort of one of the hardest men in films. Is it John Rambo? Is it yeah, yeah, one yeah. of the Arnold Schwarzenegger characters? Yeah. And we'd always say, you don't count John Rambo because he's without question. <laughs> yeah, not including John Rambo, who's the toughest dude. Uh, I feel like it's like that. It's like yeah, you yeah. don't include the marshal because he's obviously the best. Mm. So not including the marshal, who's the best? You know, that yeah, sort yeah, of thing. Yeah. Uh, anyway, Guy de Lusignan is sort of at that level. Mm. And in fact, he ambushes him and beats him, wounds him. Uh, it's, it's, it's quite a bad wound. It, see, it sounds like a sword went through his leg. Oh, bloody hell. Yeah, he threw his leg and out the other side. And he was terribly wounded and uh, nearly died of it. Had yeah. to, um, that could easily be a fatal wound now, let alone in 12th century France. Well, of course, if it uh, nicks any sort of artery, you can bleed out. Well, just infection. Uh, and if that doesn't happen, yeah. then to not get blood poisoning, septicemia, yeah. or to just not get an infection, is very lucky. That is lucky. Yeah. Um, uh, so that's sort of a, a few key things from his sort of very early life. There. And then to have use of your leg afterwards is even luckier. Yeah. You know, yeah. So it could even easily have left him a cripple. Yeah. You know. Right. Yeah. No. Absolutely. Um, Rough days. And uh, yeah. <laughs> so he was wounded and captured. Yeah. By De Lusignan. Oh, and the, the worst part. <laughs> yeah. And I think he was uh, uh, incarcerated for like a couple of years really? before Eleanor, Eleanor of Aquitaine, does pay for his release. Um, okay, so moving on with the narrative a bit then. Uh, one of the first sort of big things that he's famous for is um, becoming the tutor um, or the uh, protector of... Henry the Second, Henry Plantagenet, and Eleanor of Aquitaine's eldest son, hmm. who is also a Henry. Well, I said, sorry, before we move on from yeah. this devastating sword wound, yeah, I assume it heals up and he just carries on. Yeah, it's just you know he just carries on walking on it. Yeah, right. Well, that's bloody lucky. Yeah, I just can't get over it. That's such a devastating wound. Normally, mm. okay, he was a lucky man. Yeah, yeah. Sometimes it's 
uh, it's mad, isn't it? Sometimes you ever seen archaeology when they dig up a, 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 a skeleton, maybe from ancient times, yeah, and you can see that it had like half its jaw smashed off, whatever, but obviously lived for years after that because yeah. you know they can tell by bone analysis. Mm. But, so that was an insane injury or people doing trepanning to their head, oh, yeah, yeah. like deliberately knocking yeah. holes in your skull to release pressure, and then the, the, it's grown back, uh, yeah, and it's like Christ, okay, or people where they uh, had like giant abscesses, yeah. From your teeth and things. Yeah. Uh, it was yeah, rough, ancient rough dentistry. life in the ancient world. <laughs> yeah. Oh, there was one example just while we were talking about this. I was listening to something the other day. It was just randomly on TV. The, one of Queen Victoria's, because she had four boys, mm. Dirty Bertie, who was obviously only the oldest one. The second or third son um, at one point got shot in the back at point blank range. It went through his back and then lodged on the inside of one of his ribs. And uh, he was he was up and walking about within weeks, and li- get, went on to live until middle age, old age. Bloody hell! Yeah, of course, with no anaesthetic, no concept, even oh, of, of like. Uh, <laughs> probably, it's just lucky, right? Probably the arrowhead still be- embedded in him or something. You know? Yeah, I mean, oh no, shot with a pistol. Oh, oh right, okay. Well, uh, the bullets put still in. Though, yeah, sure. yeah. The, oh, the bullet was lodged yeah. on the inside of his ribs for the rest of his life. Yeah. <laughs> because usually you think, how are you going to survive that? Yeah, yeah uh, it just before, didn't kill me before, and so, yeah. yeah. Yeah, right. Um, so, um, famously, um, mm. Richard, uh, sorry, Henry Plantagenet and Eleanor, Eleanor of Aquitaine had two boys, Henry, um, William, oh gosh, so many names, Richard the Lionheart and King John. Yes. They're sort of the two boys that go on to dispute um, England and mm. sort of the hegemony of Western Christendom. But there were two older boys. They actually had four boys. Well, had lots of sorts, all sorts of illegitimate children. She had loads of girls as well. Um, but there were four boys. Um, there was, first of all, they had their first son, Henry. Hmm. Then there was a Geoffrey. Then there was Richard. And then there was John. Right. Um, and so, as uh, the eldest boy, this Henry was groomed to be the next king. And they just called him the young king. So because his name's Henry and his father, Henry II, is Henry, everyone just always called him the young king. So I'll call him that, the young king. Okay. Now, uh, one thing which is a little bit odd, I don't know if odd, maybe odd is exaggerating a bit, but what Henry II decided to do as soon as the young king was old enough, uh, like in his early 20s, um, was to formally uh, coronate him and crown him and make him a crown prince, Mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. So that's the thing. If people don't know, you can just be the heir in waiting or you can be a crown prince where you've already had your coronation and you're sort of legally mm. next in line. So the idea of So that, the moment of your father's death, you are the king and nothing needs to be done. There's no yeah. more legal action. Yeah. And th- this is the most stable way to transfer a, a monarchy. But the problem is, what if, what if the prince is like, well, why is my father still here? Yeah. Yeah. You know, what do I need you now yeah, for, dad? E- yeah, exactly. And uh, so- it's, you know, swings and roundabouts, <laughs> it's a burn in, in, positives and negatives. So, for example, the Kaiser, Kaiser Wilhelm II of mm. Germany in World War One, his son was a crown prince. Mm. Uh, yeah, so the idea is it just it creates stability. Yeah. But there are, it brings problems of its own. So, for example, in the early medieval period where things were a lot more cutthroat, shall we say, uh, you know, the crown prince of Germany in the early 20th century, there's no question he's going to yeah, murder not and father, or you, usurp his father, yeah. yeah. Uh, but these days it's a whole different kettle of fish. So um, so this young prince, Hen- uh, young, the young king, um, they want to give him the best possible upbringing, raising they can. Good parents. And so who better to sort of guide him than the marshal? Because mm. the marshal's a bit older, not much, but a bit older than him. And he's already been knighted. He was knighted um, on the battlefield, more or less, or just before a battle, when he was about 20. Mm. He's acquitted himself in all sorts of ways. So even at this early stage, when the marshal must have only been about 30-odd, um, he's already singled out as one of the best around, mm. you know? Um, well, he's already won a bunch of tournaments. Mm. So he's already, you know, he's already fought in battles, you know? So it's like, you're a famous man already. But yeah, absolutely. But more than that, it seems that the court of Henry and Eleanor mm. sort of personally knew him, personally mm. liked him. Uh, it's not just like he's a name, but he was actually, you know, a, a, a friend of the family, mm. perhaps is mm. one way of, of putting it. And absolutely trusted. Mm. Um, just absolutely trusted. Again, that's one of the other things that you can just find quote after quote after quote of people saying, um, 
Well, well I, I, I'm okay to take your word for it or yeah. your promise is absolutely cast iron, mm. all that sort of thing. Um, is that I People know how you're going to be hate. Sorry. People were taken on their honor. Right. Yeah. You know, and if this is an honorable man, then you can trust him. And you can also trust what they're going to do on the strength of that, even if it's not in your interest. So mm. for example, it's like, I like, say for just one little example is that later in the story, when they're old men, John King, John knows that the marshal, uh, in his mind has got no option, but to be disloyal to him at some small, uh, over mm. some small thing here. And he, he doesn't get angry with him or anything mm. because he knows that in Marshall's mind, he's got no choice. Yeah. So he's not, he's, he's not, got, he yeah, owed with him about he's, it. He's got a price of <laughs> commitments that are predictable. Yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And everyone knows that he will, he can be trusted to behave by the rules of, of chivalry, really, mm. uh, by the rules of courtly behavior and oaths and all that sort of mm. thing. And you, you can't really say that about hardly anyone else. We'll get that to, uh, uh, there's a, a few paragraphs that I'll say right in the end about his character, which sort of mm. make that clear. Um, um, okay, so he's made, um, he's, he's sort of something of a, a knight errant, they say, sort of a mm. roaming knight going around um, winning these tournaments and being the sort of protector and tutor of the young king, mm. Henry. Um, um, <clears throat> okay, yeah, so he's like, he's instructor, he's tutor in arms, sometimes it's called. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, so he's teaching but, him how to fight, how to be a man, how to be noble, how to be chivalrous. And could you have a better example? Right. Yeah. No, it seems not. Yeah. It seems not. He's like a, the, the paragon of how to behave. Mm. Um, however, it seems, oh, and, and this is becomes an important thing is that the household, the royal household of Henry yeah. Pantagenet make him swear oaths of fealty and loyalty to the young king, not to the king. Mm -hmm. um, so that becomes important because before too long, well, by the time the young king is in his mid twenties, there is a rift with his father. Um, and it's not sort of an all out balls to the wall, death or glory sort of thing, mm. but it's a very, very real rift. Mm. And there's a real uh, problem. And the young king sort of raises men and besieges castles here and there. And, and Henry II has to has to uh, marshal his forces and has to make sure he's got the 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 church on side and all sorts of things. Yeah. He has to be careful. So it's a, it's a bit of a threat. Yeah. yeah, it's a bit of a real threat. Um, but ultimately, just to cut that off, because all these things actually play out over a few years, and there's loads of details, loads of sieges all over the place. And we're going to have to cut loads of those out, especially later in the story. But here, ultimately, in the end, Henry Plantagenet gets mm. the upper hand, um, and instead of uh, exiling or imprisoning or killing is uh, the young king. He, he, he's just like, it's funny, the, the family dynamics in Henry II's family are uh, very, very interesting. There's a great film, um, an Oscar-winning film, uh, A Lion in Winter, hmm. uh, with, with Peter O'Toole. And um, have, have you ever seen that? I think no. I've mentioned that in one of our other epochs. I haven't seen it. Um, um, yeah, with... Uh, yeah, great performances in that. But there you can see the family dynamic is really strange. It's like they're all trying to fight for the throne and everything's cutthroat. But the last minute when you have to kill each other, they don't. Well, that's nice. Yeah, no, it is. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> um, so anyway, mm. well, it speaks of the age where you don't really murder rich and powerful and noble people. Mm. You imprison them. You might humiliate them a bit, uh, but you don't just kill them. Mm. Don't really do that. Uh, you don't need it with members of your own family. Certainly not. If it can possibly be avoided. So anyway, um, so where there's a rift with them, but it, it sort of um, they try to paper over it. Um, the young king is sort of left to try and regain his name and even bits of glory through tournaments, and where his best friend and tutor mm. is sort of the king of tournaments already. Um, they go around together for a period of about uh, six years or so in their prime, really. Mm. They're going from tournament to tournament to tournament, um, winning and being the best round and gaining the, all, uh, all their sort of notoriety and yeah. lots and lots of money, lots yeah. of money, really. Oh, yeah. Um, uh, well, if I could, there's a quote here sure. from, from the history, from the early 13th century, talking about the young king. It says, uh, he had no peer in prowess and largesse. Neither Arthur, it was King Arthur, nor Alexander, 
who devoted their lives to prowess, achieved so much in so little time, and how could it be otherwise, for his tutor in arms was the finest in his time, uh, or at any time since, so I find in my sources. It's the marshal, I mean, who without the slightest doubt gave him unfailing, devoted attention. Um, That's uh, awesome. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's really cool. To watch the full video, please become a premium member at lotuseaters.com.